The following is paid programming. Welcome to Something More with Chris Boyd, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner and Founder of Asset Management Resources, LLC, a registered investment advisor firm. We call it Something More because we like to talk not only about those important dollar and cents issues, but also the quality of life issues that make the money matters matter. Here he is, your fulfillment facilitator, your partner in prosperity, advising clients across the country, your host, Jay Christopher Boyd. Welcome to the program. Thanks for being with us. I'm here with Jeff Perry and Brian Regan, both of Asset Management Resources. And uh, lots to talk about uh, with regard to um, investing for this segment. But, you know, before we dive in, I've, I've noticed um, we've had uh, some notable deaths over the last... We uh, have. I know. Um, just... Recently, we had uh, Henry Kissinger pass at uh, age 100. Um, was it Rosalind Carter was uh, a week or so ago? Was she around 99, I think, I think it she was. She was 99, yeah. President Jimmy yep. Carter's wife, yep. Yep. And um, now, uh, and, you know, we could talk about any one of these people and some of the contributions and their era in which they were, um, you know, what their significance was. I think, you know, um, just, uh, just most recently with uh, Henry Kissinger's passing, we We've been talking um, in our uh, podcasts of late with topics on um, uh, Israel and some of the challenges to peace, which sure. uh, Kissinger is certainly uh, relevant in, in bringing some of the efforts to bring peace in Israel with uh, the uh, war with Egypt in the 70s. Uh, when it comes to the uh, topic of China, opening up relations with China, right. we talked about that recently and um you know there's many other things certainly uh the the issue of the vietnam war era and the challenges uh he's in in that era but he was such uh, a central figure in geopolitics for decades decades and the topic of shuttle diplomacy he kind of cr crafted that whole right. notion right. um so in any case um some big big names and uh similarly in the area of investing a, another giant um, has passed uh this week and that's charlie munger um from um you know berkshire hathaway fame in terms of you know he's he's the other half with uh really, yeah. buffett the two of them uh, being the the two people that are central and focus at at uh, berkshire hathaway at those annual meetings and their their folksy uh, isms and all kinds of uh, valuable lessons. Uh, so we yep. thought, uh, Brian, we thought we'd talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we might derive from Charlie Munger and his approach to investing, which is really credited to have um, swayed, uh, you know, the, the direction of the way they think about investing um, at Berkshire Hathaway from you know, looking for those, you know, diamonds in the rough, you know, looking for these really great values to uh, looking for just really cr great companies at a fair price. And maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the lessons uh, derived. Yeah, it's a sad time for those of us in the investing community who, you know, one of the things I love about living in the 21st century is you can through podcasts and interviews uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the regular availability of, of the writings of, of folks, you can almost uh, pick your mentors uh, without ever meeting them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, sure. uh, to me, this yeah. is a little sad as somebody who has, uh, you know, studied Berkshire Hathaway and, and, and Charlie Munger himself. Um, you know, I think it might be a little known that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger actually grew up in the same town. Uh, Charlie being a little older than than Warren, uh, but they did not know each other when they were children, uh, despite the fact that Warren Buffett actually worked in Charlie Munger's father's grocery store uh, as, a, as a boy. Um, Funny. They they met uh, later on in life as one of uh, the one of Warren's first clients uh, in in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, you know, who was really impressed with Warren uh, thought, hey, you should meet this other gentleman that we know who, who's also really, really brilliant and talented. And uh, through, they became fast, fast friends through a through a dinner. Uh, Warren Buffett had already started his partnership uh, where he was essentially a hedge, uh, essentially a hedge fund, for lack of a better word. And like Chris mentioned, he was looking for what, you know, was 
colloquially known as uh, cigar butts. He was looking for companies that were very underpriced uh, against their balance sheets. Right. Uh, Charlie Charlie got into the business because of Warren. He he was inspired by uh, you know what what could be done. In this type of, in the investing business, he was a lawyer beforehand, uh, very clear about his desire to get rich was about uh, not being beholden to anybody and being able to say and do what he wants. And that's really what he valued throughout his life. And that's that's ultimately why he, he aspired to become wealthy, uh, which I think there's, um, you know, there's a lesson there. Right. I, I, I really appreciate that. And that's something that. Um, you know, I value is is being able to speak your mind and, and being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Um, you know, he 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 lived in the same house for decades. Material things weren't necessarily as important to him as as um, you know the the value of how he used his ninety nine plus years on Earth. Um, so I, I think I think that's one of the things the great things to be learned. You know, the second thing that I, the big thing that I think. Uh, you know, he taught Warren later in life, probably in his late 30s, um, but really became a staple of what Berkshire Hathaway is and modern investing was uh, moving away from the cigar butt type of investing and trying to buy really good companies at uh, what, Char what Charlie would call fair prices. What Warren would say is, you know, he's, he's still <laughs> It's it's hard to hard to get that out of him. Well, the, the, I heard someone say uh, he moved from buying fair companies at wonderful prices to buying buying wonderful pr companies at right. fair prices, and that's a really interesting way to phrase it. You know, and that's really how I think modern investing looks at things. Right, we 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 invest with a slugging percentage, not a batting average. Um, Warren at the beginning was trying to get a high batting average where he was trying to get, uh, you know, call it 20 to 50% returns. Uh, you know, I'm sure he'd be happy with more than that, but uh, you know, he's trying to get to 20 to 50% returns by trying to derive the value that already exists within the business into his own pocket um, where, you know, Charlie's approach is more about getting multiples of your investment back over time. Um, and you know, you we call this you know slugging percentage rather than batting average. You rather had a home run rather than a single, um, and that really started out with the first. And I, I believe one of the first investments with this strategy was Seas Candy. Uh, Seas Candy is a business that Berkshire Hathaway still owns today. Uh, but you know, it was what from what Warren was historically used to. I think it would have been considered very expensive, but it was a fantastic business. Uh, that uh, you know they could reinvest the profits at at nice returns for for many years to come and, and, and done very well. Um, you know they 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 ran separate um, separate partnerships for a while before coming together under the Berkshire umbrella. Uh, their first uh, foray together, I believe, was blue chip stamps. Um, you know, and and that's that's when they they started the the, the wonderful partnership that they they had until sadly um, this week. But you know. The, it, even up until a, a month ago, I listened to an interview for, on the Acquired podcast from uh, with Charlie Munger. He was still very sharp, still he very brilliant. Was. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's 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 was shocking to me that he didn't make it to his hundredth birthday, which would have been in January. So um, you know, this is upsetting. I think uh, he one of my favorite things about him that you know maybe this is a personality trait that we share or I aspire to share is that uh you know he wasn't shy about saying what he thought um and i think that's an important trait especially in this business where there can be a lot of groupthink and groupthink can be very dangerous uh and having a, a strong perspective and in charlie's case almost always being right um is, is a good combination i always enjoyed watching the two of them when they did interviews together uh, becky quick on cnbc had a series of interviews with the Two of them over the years and as you mentioned brian one of them is not that long ago and <clears throat> he's still sharp he's still right focused on his beliefs core values and what a you know what a blessing not only is the world to have had charlie munger but the blessing himself he was able to live until 99 years old and be that focused and that still working at something that he loved i particularly liked the interaction between the two I mean, I think if you ask 100 people, Berkshire Hathaway, who's who's in charge, they say Warren Buffett, right? But Charlie was comfortable and, you know, meaningful in his own way at being in that number two seat. And I don't know if he'd like that call, but that number two seat 
And they would, when you see these interviews, they would always give the other credit. They would always be complimenting the others for two people to, of such authority and such wealth to be able to work together so closely for that many years and be successful and be humble and be focused on doing good things is, uh, is something we just don't see today very often. I'd heard too that there was, you know, maybe not always the same dynamic uh, in front of the cameras, behind the cam, you know, out of the sight of the camera, where well, it could be it might be much more <laughs> um, candid, you know, or you know, have more, uh, co- you know, discuss active discussion, you know, confrontational, or like oh, I don't agree, kind of stuff. Then and, and that, but they still have this great, uh, thoughtful discussion, kind of to come up with the great solutions they've come up with. Well, I think those active discussions confrontational as long as they're polite and respectful are some right. of the right. uh, most productive com- business leaders have or leaders in the community political leaders can have i think sometimes we're not doing that because of being uncomfortable but the greatest ideas can come out of those discussions if you have an open mind and an open heart there's plenty of notable times when they disagreed uh, for example Charlie is or was, um, that's going to be hard to, to adjust to. Um, Charlie was on the board of Costco mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, Warren Buffett never bought any Costco shares. He famously does not like retail companies in general. Um, and, you know, Charlie has been a huge supporter of Costco since my understanding is the beginning when it was FedMart. Uh, so we're going back um, a, a very long time. Mm. Uh, be, you know, be even prior to Jim Senegal's "quote unquote" founding of, of of Costco, so you know that's that's one high profile one. Uh, but you know, even going back into uh, the '80s when they made an investment in Solomon Brothers, I do not believe that this was one of the investments that Charlie was um, um, yeah. Yeah. fully on board with. Although he, I, I, I do believe, you know, he, he ended up having an active role in saving um you know john goodfriend's uh solomon brothers which was a you know famously a disaster and and fraudulent in a lot of ways so um you know there there were some high profile ones in their history uh and you know interestingly enough when when charlie's charlie and warren ran different partnerships back in the 50s before uh warren you know quote unquote retired uh, he, he, I don't know if you know this or not, but he did retire from his partnership. Um, but he didn't, you know, he could, didn't really, he couldn't, couldn't physically do it. Um, you know, Warren's, Warren's partnership was doing much, much better than Charlie's, but, you know, ultimately Warren ended up adopting for the most part, Charlie's view of the world, which is, um, you know, really interesting, you know, dynamic between the two of them, just like you were saying, Jeff. Hmm. Um, Brian, you shared with us some uh, really great quotes. Uh, were you planning to share any of those with our audience? Um, you, you shared those yesterday and uh, just off the cuff when we were talking about Charlie's passing. Um, thought it'd be maybe a good idea to share a few of those. Well, I, I think a few good ones are, 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 I think there's really three simple ones that I'd, I'd like to talk about. And you guys can <clears throat> know bring up the other ones if you're interested in it. But, um, you know, when, when it comes to life, I think he says the first, the first rule mm-hmm. to being at, at a happy, having a happy life is having low expectations. And I've heard him say this a lot, you know, the, the, the worst thing you can do is compare yourself to your neighbor. And, um, you know, ultimately that can drive you nuts. But if you have a rational expectation of what you think you're capable of and where you think your life can lead, um, you can reach happiness. And, you know, um, Morgan Howell's best Housel's best-selling book, The Psychology of Money, goes into this too. What's enough for you? And quite frankly, I have this conversation with casually with people in my life, and it, I think it opens up a lot of doors and uh, thinking about you know, where you want to spend your money, what's truly important to you. Um, and to me, it's opened up my eyes on what's important to me and how I would like my savings and how I would like to direct my cash. So I think that is one of the biggest lessons I, I think that he has bestowed upon the world. And it's been quote, quoted and requoted in book after book and used as a, as a high example. Um, and, and that's a big one for me. He does have a lot of uh, a great sense of humor as well. In the interview that I was referring to with Becky Quick on CNBC recently, 
he attributed low expectations to the success of his marriage where his wife had low expectations of him and therefore he was always able to exceed them <laughs> he had that dry sense of humor that he could he could uh you never knew when he was shifting from being a serious commentary to humor which made it even more funny when you sat in it yeah brian yeah, do you have talked, another he talked about waiting a lot didn't he well i i think there's this misconception and i think this is especially prevalent among young younger <clears throat> investors where you have to be doing something all the time when it comes mm. to investing. You need to be trading, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that. And, um, you know, especially for, for um, you know, somebody like me, it's just, it, it was diff especially more difficult when I was younger because, um, you know, when I was growing up, you always had to be doing something. Uh, you know, if you're not, you know, when I worked in restaurants when I was a teenager, we had a saying, if you can lean, you can clean. Um, <laughs> basically meaning you do not ever sit still always be looking to doing something and what charlie was trying to say is you know, patience in investing is a very valuable mm. thing to have uh you don't research a great company invest in a great company and be patient with that company now at the same time he also acknowledges that almost every great business that he's ever invested in has gone under at some point mm -hmm. uh, not until he's recouped his investment many times over um so, you know, it's not that you just have to be patient, but you also have to be diligent on the competitive factors that are happening on your company. So um, I think those are, are, are big things that he preached uh, to Warren, um, but also to the general community. And, uh, you know, I think that's those are very valuable lessons. Do you think um, we don't often think about the importance of cash, but it seems to me in the success of um, Berkshire Hathaway, um, the role of cash has been a, a, an aspect of the success they've had by having uh, liquidity at key points in time. Um, any thoughts on that? I think that's a little bit of a misconception. I think that's common, commonly quoted now about how much cash Berkshire Hathaway has. But you need to remember that a big part of Berkshire Hathaway. You need to invest at key times, is I guess what I'm driving at. Yeah, but let, let's just to, to, to caveat the conversation that I understand where you're going, but Berkshire Hathaway has a big insurance arm and insurance companies need to have cash on hand to be able to pay out liabilities mm -hmm. that are often unexpected. So that is a huge reason why Berkshire Hathaway holds a lot of cash. Now, second, you know, second to that, you're right. They're very careful with their cash. They're not, they're not, you know, pushing it out long on the curve. Um, they know they prioritize operating cash flows. So, all the all their holding companies are paying them regularly and that is something that they they very much care about they are passionate about and always have been about um you know making sure that they pay the parent company at berkshire rather rather than um, reinvesting the money frivolously into the, the holding company businesses and this is all to say to chris's point that they make sure they have the liquidity to reinvest in a better opportunity if it comes available um, so I think that's also, you know, a great lesson um, for investing and also a good reason not to trade, right? Like right. if you think about it, if you own a great business and it goes up, let's say it goes up 30, 40%. And, you know, let's say the business gets better at 30, 40%. That's not a reason to sell the company, especially mm -hmm. if it's paying off cash flow. And if you do sell the company, well, now you have this whole pile of cash that you need to reinvest somewhere? Do you have a better opportunity elsewhere to invest? What Berkshire essentially always says is pay us the cash. We'll decide how to allocate, allocate the funds. And that's been the primary driver of Berkshire's success as a conglomerate. Conglomerates don't typically work. Um, there's about nine people that work and actually work in Omaha in the central headquarters office. But ultimately, they're deciding how how to allocate the capital to the different holding companies and to investors, and um, you know that's how they add value at, as a conglomerate, um, either through the operating cash flow or the float of the insurance funds. Excellent. Um, well, uh, parting comments. We got thirty seconds. I mean, my my only parting comment is to, would be to say this is a very sad day for for all of us, and um, you know I'm very thankful to know that there's uh, a good 60 years of Charlie Munger mm -hmm. commentary, um, books written about him. Uh, thank God for YouTube. I can go back and mm -hmm. 
watch his quips on almost any subject that he's ever been asked on. And I will continue to do that likely for the rest of my life. All right. Thank you. Um, with that, we're going to pause here and uh, invite everyone, if you have any needs, to reach out uh, as it relates to your financial planning or portfolio management. Certainly give us a call and uh, reach out to us. Thanks for being with us for this segment, Brian. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to Something More with Chris Boyd. Call us for help, whether it's financial planning, portfolio management, insurance concerns, or those quality of life issues that make the money matters matter. Whatever's on your mind, visit us at amrfinancial.com or call us toll free at 866-771-8901 or send us your questions to radio at amrfinancial.com. 